what you're saying is there isn't really an intuitive way to well, understand. The only intuitive way to get into it, well, there's no intuitive way, but the way to, that, that I, um, there's an experiment that people will often do as kids at high school. You just have to, you have two speakers generating a monochromatic signal. And you can get monochromatic signals easily now because you can get tuning fork apps on your phone and it just generates a, a monochromatic, so single frequency sound. And you generate that out the two speakers. And what happens is that it generates an interference pattern in the, in the room. And you can walk around the room and hear them peaks and troughs. Have you done that experiment? No, no, no. But I mean, I've seen in a lot of physics class that's done with water where like you see waves and not necessarily with sound so the waves they the uh a wave tank in terms of generating all those so again you can now get at wave tank apps so i use them in my teaching as well the animation aspect of it and seeing things moving is really important in understanding syntax aperture radar so seeing how all those interference patterns operate when you move scatters around and stuff yeah and you can do it in a wave tank on an overhead projector um is where i first saw it or you can just get a wave tank app there's several ones you can get now to download but the, but to experience that interference pattern yourself by walking around and actually hearing where it's loud and then an area where it's quiet and get the students to walk around and i go oh yeah i can i can actually experience that interference pattern it's not just something that's on a drawing it's a real physical thing and then what i try to do in the um and that's the, what i try to do in the book is, is bring that as the basis that once you start to understand that it, what's causing that interference pattern everything else can be explained on the back of that so aperture synthesis can be explained on that. Speckle can be explained on that. Interferometric SAR can be explained on that. Um, you just have to get to grips with those interference patterns and why they're created. And once you get that, not quite that everything follows after, but it's. But I think that's that's my approach to to giving that grounding. That if you if you realize that everything is based on that general principle, a lot of the other topics can be explained using the same things the same diagrams and the same analogies. And then it makes that a lot easier to then connect things together and go, okay, I get that. So of course, ultimately you have to ask my students whether it works <laughs> and whether they understand it or whether they're just nodding politely. Is it that that helped you? Well, that's my, cause that's how, uh, for me, that's how I understood it. The, um, because of having done stuff with holograms, uh, as an undergraduate, I had an understanding of how holograms work. Uh, the project I did with the hologram is actually an interferogram. So what you can do with holograms is you can, what we did was had a little, um, it was me and a, a classmate, there's that we had a little metal bar with a, that had a weight attached to it so that it would bend the bar back. But of course, imperceptibly in terms of, you know, visibly you couldn't see it. But what you do is you take a hologram of the, the bar and then you change the weight or you add the weight so that it's, it moves the, the metal bar slightly. You do a, a, a double exposure of the hologram. And so as you double expose the plate, so interestingly, you have to do all of this in pitch darkness. But when you double expose the holographic plate, you actually end up with the fringes of the um, associated with the slight movement of the, the bar because the, the light has got to travel an extra tiny disk. And that's essentially radar interferometry. All right. So, so I was the, the concepts and understanding through the holograms is what made understanding interferometric radar a lot easier because, well, I'd done it already in a holographic context so when when people talk about sar uh one of the things that comes up is it can see through clouds and that's why it's great but there's a lot more to that what what is the or what are some of the things that you find most exciting most interesting about sar because i the, the reason i ask that is because i i find that to be an interesting angle to start with when talking to people about why should you even care about this thing? It's a lot more complicated than all these other sources of data, but it's still really interesting and there's some unique properties about it. And so there's the explaining how it works, that's one aspect, but the another one is why does it even matter? And that's what I'd like to dig into from, from your point of view at least. There is uh, a sort of a terrible history of SAR that is associated with um, saying, look how wonderful SAR is, it can see through clouds, right? And there are some applications, um, military applications might be one, but disaster response and everything else, where you say, well, if I can be guaranteed an image, whether it's cloudy or not, clearly advantageous. So um, why a terrible history? It sounds like a nice- Well, it's a terrible history because what, what it, it means is that everybody forgets the fact that that's the least important 
benefit of SAR in terms of why SAR, you're asking why SAR are particularly different. I mean, I was at a conference, I won't name what the conference is. Um, but I was at a conference and they had a session looking at SAR and they were all talking about images and how difficult it was to interpret images and all these high resolution commercial companies providing, you know, really detailed uh, submeter resolution SAR data and how difficult it was to interpret the images and everything else. And the whole session was just about images. And I thought, well, but who cares about the images? They're, that's the, you know, backscatter is the least exciting part of synthetic aperture radar. So just, I want to backscatter being... So just the brightness. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you've got the waves coming back and you've got the, the magnitude of those waves. So how bright they are. So it's what you would see if you get a single image and you open it up and or you normalize it a little bit like this gradient of color is that that's what we're talking yep. about. Yeah. I just want to like add a yep. lot of context. Good point. So the backscatter you're saying least interesting. I mean, it's useful uh, in some contexts, but it's the least, in, it's the least sort of interesting from the perspective of what, what makes SAR particularly good or, or unique. It's when you get into looking at the phase information. So w the cycle of where the, 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 the wave is at and and in particular, if you can get multiple measurements, and that's either in polarization or multiple images, where you can look at the difference in those phases. And that's where things really become amazing, right? And the, so the interferometric um, wide swath mode on, on Sentinel-1, for example, is fantastic for doing interferometry. And, it's, and it seems to be the least spoken about. Now, to be fair, there are, there are sectors and... Uh, areas that use this as a regular thing. A lot of the geophysicists, for example, use it. Radar interferometry as standard. There's a lot of people doing things like permanent scatter interferometry and looking at long-term motions of the ground surface. Uh, but in, in other areas, it sort of seems to be ignored. I'm very, I'm very glad to, to, that I'm, I'm, well, I'm hoping. I was informed that there will be some interferometric coherence magnitude that, um, layers that will come onto Earth Engine soon, or sometime in 2023, which is fantastic from my EarthBlocks perspective as well, because bringing in coherence magnitude is a, is a completely unique kind of measure that is just incredible in terms of what it's potentially able to do. It's, it's most famous for being able to detect very small changes in the, uh, in the surface. And so the Unsurprisingly, the military therefore have got a lot, a lot of interest in that. If something drives across a desert, the desert might look exactly the same as it was before and after, but the interferometric coherence will, will pick that up and you'll see a big strip through the desert where something is driven. So not surprisingly, the various points in the early 1990s, that became an interesting topic. Right. But, the, um, but we've looked at, uh, we did a little interesting study partly for fun at the, in the Nazca Plateau in Peru. So you know where there's the big lines and the geoglyphs. Um, it is, uh, Eric von Daniken made it famous in the 1970s by claiming that these were landing strips for alien spacecraft. <laughs> but so it's, it's a big desert plateau. <laughs> Virtually nothing ever happens on these plateaus. And that's why these thousand year old uh, carvings on the surface of the, of the desert are still visible and they're still there. And if you look at the optically, or if you just look at it every day, you can go back and everything just looks exactly the same. But if you use interferometric coherence magnitude, you can actually see where people have driven across the, the roads. Um, you can see where the a very occasional rainfall has um, washed across some of the, the pampa. Because just moving, the, randomly moving the stones on the surface in fractions of a wavelength, so centimeters, is detectable from space so that just as a, as a simple measure of, of things like change and i think we've still to see lots of new applications come about from from that so if we can get it onto earth engine and earth blocks and make that uh, easy for people to get a hold of i think there's going to be lots of interesting stuff that will suddenly appear that we didn't know we could look at with coherence magnitude so the again i i, I like trying to rephrase make sure i understand the value of SAR is kind of exponential for every new image. So if you have one image, you, you have a certain value. If you have two images, it's more than the sum of the two images in terms of yep, kind of value. Of 
And but if you have optical, it's just it's quite linear. If you well, maybe a little bit more, but if you get another image, all you can do is has has it changed from the the previous day you have an image, but it's only kind of a visual inspection. You can't really you you can't have a whole entire new data set that's created just by adding one more image. But in SAR, you can do this, but you need like the value of, of that kind of grows, let's say, exponentially with the more images that you have. It, that's a nice way of putting it, yes. Right. Exponential might be steeper than yeah. really, but the <laughs> general idea. Absolutely. And the thing is that that phase information is a, is a, it's a geometry thing. So the way to think about SAR is that SAR is really good at measuring geometry. So rather than, you know, the very small movements. So when you start to use the phase differences to detect change, there's a famous one of uh, London, for example, using permanent scatter or interferometry. And you can see geographical things in the image in terms of where the ground has has risen or or sunk, and it's it's not noise, right? It's definitely right. geographic patterns. And then you look at the scale, and the scale is minus four millimeters a year up to plus four millimeters a year, and you think, what four millimeters? That's just a tiny little yeah. shift. How on earth can we measure that from six hundred kilometers above the earth? And that's it's those kind of very sensitive geometric measurements. So the earthquake people use it now all the time. Volcano people use it all the time. Um, it's being used for landslides. It's being used for detecting the stability of railway lines and infrastructure and everything. So in an engineering context, there's a whole area of synthetic aperture radar, which is just using that as a regular thing. And it's, uh, and it's often forgot about in, in some other sectors where we go, oh, you can see through clouds. Hey, if you like this, you can actually listen to the full interview right here. Otherwise, I'll catch you next time. Cheers.